morning, everybody, and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Jesse Weber, joined here by fellow host Vincent Hill, and thanks for joining us. Let's break out of this for one second. Joining me is civil rights attorney John Phillips. John, I know that you have uh, quite the history with this case. You know a lot about it. What do you make so far of the closing arguments from the prosecution? So far, very effective. And I want to I point out one little point. Look at her lapel pin. It's a, it's a badge, and I think that's a very smart move when you're trying to, to, to have a defendant that was a former cop show that you're actually on the side of law enforcement. That's a big point. Um, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we will be live in closing arguments in the Newman Raja trial. We'll be right back. Well, that's the prosecutor laying out the case against the defendant, Mr. Raja. I'm back here with John Phillips, who consulted Corey Jones' mother's side of the family after the shooting and has followed the case closely. Uh, John, were you surprised yesterday that Raja didn't take the stand? I know I was. I, I was, you know, particularly given his defense thus far and, and kind of his spokespeople's uh, talking through this. So, um, you, you know, the question is, what's, what's the jury going to think uh, about him remaining silent? Of course, he has the right to do so, but I, I kind of expected him to testify just like you. Yeah, because didn't he have to explain at least the discrepancies between what he said in his walkthrough and what the evidence ultimately showed? Exactly. Exactly that. And, and you know, the prosecutor is doing a pretty good job. And now, as, as, you're, as, as the fans of law and crime know, she has to prove beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt and so I, 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 I don't want to see her skipping over science as much as she has saying you have it in your notes or skipping over, uh, you know, using comments like, does that make sense? Show them why this makes sense or it doesn't make sense. So I'm getting a little nervous because because I frankly want to see a conviction here. Well, I will tell you this much. I think she's going to be giving quite a lengthy closing argument, as will the defense. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be live. Stay tuned here. I'm Law and Crime. Okay, let's break out of this for one second. I'm joined here by our fellow host on the network, Vincent Hill. Vincent, you've always thought that there was suspicious behavior on the part of Raja and the prosecutor is just laying into that. What do you make of the point she's raising today? Well, she's making several points, and the, the key point is where was the gun, right? We heard Raja say he's hit three to four times. So at what point did Corey drop the gun? Was it before? Because we hear in that call he says, hold on. Right. So he still doesn't know Raja as a police officer at this point. So did he drop the gun then when he figured out he didn't know how to operate it because we know it was on safety? Was he still running at that point? When did Corey drop that gun? When did that imminent threat cease to exist. And we don't know because none of it was captured on video, just audio. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be live in Raja. Stay tuned. Okay, let's get some perspective right now. I'm here with John Phillips, who had actually consulted Corey Jones' mother's side of the family after the shooting and has been following the case closely. Uh, John, let me ask you, is the prosecutor making out a clear case here of manslaughter and or attempted murder? Right. You know, she's explained the difference and that it's it's two separate time gaps. Being a prosecutor during a closing argument is building a house. And we all know Trayvon's case and, and where John Guy and some of the prosecutors may not have built the manslaughter house because they were working on murder. Here, the whole house is manslaughter. The whole house is this culpable, reckless conduct. And she's she's hit on it. You know, she's had a couple of lapses. Um, the 33 second thing that she kind of backed out of, but it's, you, you can tell one thing about this prosecutor that she's lived with this case and she's passionate about it. And she's, she's done a pretty effective job. As have many people, everybody's watching the conclusion of this trial. And that also includes Vincent Hill. Vincent, one of the interesting things you had mentioned to me was one of the points she mentioned was the idea that criticizing the defense's expert that it's not uncommon in officer related shootings for officers to recount details inaccurately. That was the defense's point, And she hit upon that. You had said to me that you also don't believe that's accurate. What did you make of that point? Well, I don't believe it quite simply because, Jesse, when you have to use phrases like and um, I'm thinking and a lot of ums, if you're recalling a traumatic event, you don't have to think about it. You can recall it instantly. And I think the prosecution also did a great job when she said, what was the sense of urgency for Raja to pull in the 
on the exit ramp the way he did. He says, I thought it was an abandoned vehicle. He could have gone down to the next exit, circled around, or to her point, he was told if anything happens, call a mark unit. He could have done that. He should have done that. He didn't do it, and that's why we are where we are. Yeah, and we're seeing sort of the conclusion of the prosecution's case. John, when the defense begins their closing argument, what can you expect, or what should we expect? They're going to hit her on these these little holes that she had, the, the places where where she kind of said, and I'm, I've got to look at my notes, where, where she was saying something didn't make sense. Uh, they're going to explain where, where reasonable doubt lives. And, and to, to his point, the truth is always spontaneous. The truth always comes out immediate. When you have delays and ums and ahs and, and other verbal cues, let me think about that. It, that's, that's, where the, that's where the deceit sometimes lies difficult case and the jury's going to ultimately have to decide it. So let's take a quick break on our end. And when we come back, we may be live with the defense's closing argument. Stay tuned. Okay, as we watch the gallery of people listening to the closing arguments here, John, what does this day mean for Corey Jones family? It's a day of hopeful closure. They've, they, it's been several long years where they've 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 dealt with the stand your ground hearings and and now they're finally at trial and in the case we handled Jordan Davis there was actually two criminal trials they had to go through it twice but it's just you, you see a lot of sad faces that are dealing with you know the loss of a loved one and is this a clear cut case I mean let, let's just break it down real quick. We know that Raja faces a different options here. He's on trial for manslaughter and attempted first degree murder, but they could find him guilty. Uh, first, they could find him not guilty uh, if they go with the self-defense uh, theory, but also they could find him guilty of something less, you know, uh, culpable negligence, uh, attempted second degree murder, aggravated assault with a firearm, merely assault. I mean, this, is this a tough case for a jury here? All cases are tough for a jury, particularly when they're asked to convict somebody that, that had a position of trust, like a law enforcement officer. Yeah, I, I just I feel like the facts are set out for manslaughter. It, it's 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 called it, it's neglect. It's it's reckless neglect. Um, you know, neglect plus sort of. It, and, and there are lesser included. I, I think if they truly find that that this officer did something nefarious, if he planted the gun, I think that's when they're going to really consider that attempted first degree murder charge. But again, the, the prosecutor built the house related to manslaughter. And I think they have the evidence there. And it's again, the, it's all based upon that roadside assistance call and that walkthrough from Raja. Would you would you agree those two pieces of evidence could be deciding the whole case right there? Exactly. The inconsistencies by Raja and, and what he didn't say and then the words that the police officers it's when these things happen put in their mouth i tried one in federal court on a civil side last year and and officers tend to overstate when they get in trouble after an incident and and roger did it here and those words might forever haunt him now vincent i'm also here with vincent hill vincent what should have raja done what was the protocol if he was in plain clothes looking for you know car thefts what should he have done well, Jesse, he never should have gotten out of the vehicle, quite simply. He should have called that in, said, hey, I believe there's an abandoned vehicle here. In fact, Jesse, at the beginning of his statement, he said, I believe I called it in on, on the radio, which we know he didn't do. That was proper protocol. And he even said, to John's point, during that initial video statement, I was told not to get out if I saw something suspicious. I should call it in if I need to assist after a mark unit gets there put on my vest and get out. He didn't do that. And I think that's going to come back to haunt him, Jesse. Does the defense have to say at some point, listen, he did properly identify himself as an officer. It wasn't captured on audio. And at the very least, our client, he didn't hear um, Jones say, huh? He, he thought that Jones understood he was an officer. I mean, don't they have to make that point? Because isn't this identification the biggest issue in this entire case? Yeah, that is the biggest uh, piece of this case here. But Think about this, Jesse, at three in the morning, this guy comes to you in a baseball cap, an inside out t-shirt and some blue jeans. Even if he said police, are you really going to believe it? I mean, look how many people have been raped, have been kidnapped by people saying, oh, I'm the, a police officer when it turns out not to be. It's three in the morning. This guy jumps out of this van. He pulls the wrong way on this exit ramp. And 
Corey Jones probably thought, hey, I'm about to be robbed. So in that instance, Corey Jones had every right to defend himself and stand his ground. Now, John, one of the things that Vincent and I talked about, and, and it's interesting to think about, what would have happened if Jones, if every, all the facts are the same, same roadside assistance, but in the middle of this, what you could call a gunfight, Jones did fire his weapon and kills Raja. What kind of case would we have there? I mean, you're just kind of looking at the reverse facts, and and I, I, it's tough. Uh, you know, Jones actually had the right to shoot and kill Raja. He, he, again, he didn't know he was a law enforcement officer, uh, and, and you know, again, we've 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 gotten so caught up in in Raja's stand your ground rights, we forget about Jones's, and he had them too. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And we, we're analyzing what Raja said throughout the whole course of this case. And one of the things that stands out for me, Vincent, and I know it stands out for you, is aim. What, what does that mean exactly? Why would, have, why would Raja have said aim when firing his weapon? Well, Jesse, it goes back to what I said about embellishing. Anytime you're making something up, when you're trying to get people to believe you're being truthful, you embellish stuff. And I assure you, it goes back to what I always say. In policing, we rely on two things, training and muscle memory. Jesse, I went to the gun range so many times in the academy and in service just to go and refresh on my shooting. Police do not yell, aim, when they're about to pull the trigger. They may say things like, drop the gun, drop the gun, show me your hands, police, show me your hands. But the word aim, I assure you, is that that's not something a police officer says when they pull the trigger. Jesse, that's something he was just quite simply making up. That's a, I mean, that one just stuck out for all of us. And, and John, back to you. We're going to probably see the conclusion of the prosecution's closing argument here. Uh, they may have a rebuttal, but I want to just go back to the defense. Are they going to really harp on the point that, yes, Jones was shot, but he still walk, He could still walk. He could still walk around, and, and he could have still been a threat. That was based upon the testimony from yesterday. How much are they going to harp on that, you think? I would suspect they were they're going to talk about that. They're going to try to frame this as good police work and sound police work and that Raja doesn't have to put his life at risk or the lives of others. And that's the part that they that the prosecutor didn't really go into. He can use force to prevent harm to himself and others. And in theory, in Raja's theory, you had a a escaping felon in a sense because he had assaulted um, and, and attempted to use a weapon. Uh, at or in the direction of Raja. And so they're going to try to make Jones a bit of the bad guy um, and good cop took down bad guy, uh, at least from, from Raja's perspective. And they, they, I could see that argument because what they could say is, look, he did have a weapon on him. The shooting wasn't captured on video. We can't positively identify, I mean, we have to take Raja's word for it about when he saw that weapon, when he saw Jones's weapon, and that's the biggest point here. Yes, we have audio, yes, we have his walkthrough, but we don't have a video of the shooting, and that could be the biggest point of all. Now, John, I know our time together has come to a conclusion, so I appreciate you coming on and speaking about this, and I know this case uh, hits very close to home, and you followed it for a while, so this is going to conclusion it for you as well. Thank you so much for having us. Of course. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, Vince and I will be here to discuss more of this trial. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Long Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, joined here by fellow host Vincent Hill, and we're breaking down a major case here on the network, but we have a lot more to talk about, so let's get started. First up, I want to let you know about a brand new trial we're going to be covering here on the Long Crime Network. It's out of Iowa, and it's the Jason Carter case. We expect to be live there tomorrow. This man has been charged with first-degree murder for allegedly shooting and killing his mother, Shirley Carter, in her home on June 19, 2015. His father and brother actually filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him and they won. They obtained a $10 million judgment against him. And interestingly enough, evidence from that civil case is what's helped prosecutors now file criminal charges against this man. Carter has claimed that he didn't do it. And he's even pointed the finger at his father, as well as a tip from an inmate that there were two other suspects who killed Shirley as part of a burglary gone wrong. So clearly this case will be interesting to follow, and we do expect to be live there tomorrow. Right now, though, we are waiting to go back live into the Newman Raja trial. 
We are at the conclusion of this really important case out of Florida, this former officer who has been charged with manslaughter and attempted first degree murder. We just saw, the, uh, I believe, the conclusion of the prosecution's closing argument. We're going to wait to see what the defense will do in their closing argument. And by all accounts, the prosecution will have a rebuttal closing argument. And what a morning it's been. I'd like to bring in right now Vincent Hill to talk more about what we saw today. Mm -hmm. Just a, an amazing morning. Really, the prosecutor had to uh, make out the case for these charges. Right. A lot of detail. She was on for over an hour. What did you make of the way she laid out the case? I think she proved a pretty compelling case for manslaughter, Jesse, and she touched on a few things. She was using words like reasonable. Would it be reasonable for Corey to act a certain way? Would it be reasonable for Raja to act a certain way? Why did Raja not attempt to escape the danger? Because as a police officer, you're trained to seek cover if you come under fire. He never did that. He says, I chased him. I ran after him. So, and what was the urgency for Raja to approach Corey Jones? If his statement is true that I thought it was an abandoned vehicle, and he even says, I got caught with my pants down because I should have assumed the car was occupied. Of course he should have. So he should have gone to another way where he could turn around and come behind the car, maybe turn on his flashers. Or better yet, just call in a Mark Unit, Jesse, and say, hey, there's a car here. It could be abandoned. Send someone to check it out. But he didn't do that. So he gets out of the car, he sees Jones, and his suspicions widen because, again, his whole job is to see that there's, you know, burglaries. There's not burglaries, there's car thefts going on. So he sees this guy on the side of the road at 3, a little 3.15 a.m. In the, in the morning. The question that I have, and I think the jury has to answer, is when did he see Jones' gun? At what point? Right. Right? Because if you look at the conversation from the roadside assistance call, the idea that Jones says, hold on, after after uh, the defendant takes out his weapon and says, get, get, what does that tell you? To me, Jesse, in my opinion, and again, I've been on several traffic stops, I personally believe Raja had walked up to Corey. This is the part I think Raja's leaving out. He had walked up to Corey. Corey was probably still seated inside his vehicle or maybe just kind of peeking his head out. And as Raja got close, he saw Corey with the gun. But again, Corey did not know Raja was a police officer. I mean, here's a guy, no criminal history. He had just played at, at, at a, a, a club with his band. He's, he's, just, he's yeah. just trying to get home. So the, the, the likelihood that Corey would all of a sudden say, you know what, I want to kill a police officer is, is slim to none. It's zero. And, and you, you had made a very good point, and we're going to jump back live in a second, but that, that you don't believe Jones's, uh, Raja's account that he showed his badge earlier in the night to a guy walking his dog. No, again, it, it comes back to embellishing. Why would you even do that? You're just out driving in this neighborhood. You're like, oh, sir, I'm, here's my badge. I'm a police officer. You know, I would love to have seen them say, okay, well, we track this guy down to confirm your story. But they didn't do that because, again, he, he made it up. And you, you said he embellished a lot of facts. I All mean, right. the idea that he would yell, aim, before he fired his weapon is strange to you. Yeah, that and the fact that he mentions Lux Nightclub. You know, they're having this hip-hop concert, so they had riot gear just in case something breaks out. Has nothing to do with the shooting death of Corey Jones, so he embellished a lot. Let's play devil's advocate, okay? The defense is about to begin their closing argument. They have some tools to use here. I mean, they have some evidence to back it up, the idea that Jones was armed with a weapon. Right. Um, what do you think, what are you expecting to see here? Well, and that's the point that defense is going to say. He was armed with a weapon. He came out on Raja first, according to Raja in his statement. As soon as I pulled up and said police, he pointed the gun at me. And we heard the medical testimony that he could have ran for, you know, several hundred yards or feet after that. So that's what they're going to key in on here. Corey Jones was armed, he came across a police officer, and he tried to pull the trigger. Yeah, the idea that this uh, defense expert said that he could have gotten shot in the heart, still traveled, still have moved a, a little bit, still have been a threat, although, as the prosecution said, he was a hostile witness, and juries don't always like that. Let's go back live into the courtroom. The defense has begun their closing argument. Well, All right, so as we listen to the defense's closing argument, Vincent, you saw some things that you think are not quite accurate. Yeah, they, well... <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here, not, not, not quite accurate, but I see what the defense is doing. He's saying that, listen, Corey was an armed guy. Raja had no time to react. He was in the line of fire, so he, he had to react appropriately. And that's what he's going to try to drive home to this jury, that 
even though, yes, he didn't follow his training, he didn't follow his protocol, he didn't follow his orders because he was told to be clearly identified, he had no time to react, and he acted the way he did in self-defense. Yeah, you had also made the point to me that, you know, that vest is not really 25 pounds, yeah. there, maybe there wasn't that many burglaries going on. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we will be live in this courtroom, and we'll cover more of the closing argument. wait to jump back live in the defense's closing argument right here and they're just trying to lay out the facts of what happened and saying he called it you know a tragic accident at one point uh vincent before we jump back tragic accident is that a fair characterization of one theory of how this could have happened not at all because accident is the sense that things happen because of an accident but when you purposely point a gun at someone and pull the trigger and continue continually give chase, Jesse, that is not an accident. It's purpose. He did that on purpose. He chased Corey Jones. He continued to fire. We heard three shots. We heard 10 seconds of no shots, and then we heard three more shots. So you can't use the word accident here, Jesse, at all. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, and it's probably not the last time we're going to hear that terminology. Let's just jump back live right now with the defense's closing argument. All right, so as we listen to the defense's closing argument, Vincent, I mean, one of the points he made is he didn't know Raja what was going on there. He, the, we know that Corey Jones had a gun; it was loaded. He, how was he supposed to know it was in safety mode or not? I mean, that's, isn't that a good point? I mean, that is a great point because you don't have to wait for someone to, to fire upon you to use deadly force. If you're met with de deadly force, you respond with deadly force. So whether it was loaded or not, whether it had a round in the chamber, doesn't really matter. So to the defense's point. That's an excellent point, and that's how police officers are trained. All right, we're going to have to see the, how they do the rest, with the rest of the closing. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back live in that Florida courtroom. Okay, Vincent, this is a big point that they're making right here, the defense, that this is not a man, Corey Jones, as the prosecution would say, who was running for his life and that, uh, you know, Raja was trying to kill him, that he fired all these shots when the gun was still in the possession, still in the hands of Jones, did what he had to do to, to put down the threat, and he wasn't even sure that he killed him. He thought that there was still an active shooting situation. What do you make of this argument? So it is a great point, Jesse, but here, as a prosecutor, I'd have a rebuttal because the defense said, well, he fired the shot to the chest when Corey Jones still had his arm up, pointing the gun at him. That's an assumption. Corey could have been like, hey, man, why are you still chasing me? What's going on? So we don't know. That's a theory the defense has. But as a prosecutor, I would come back and still say, well, yeah, Corey Jones was pointing the gun at Newman Raja because he didn't know who this guy was. He did not know he was a police officer. The fact that there could be two sides to this story and one could be conceivably an officer trying to protect himself, is that reasonable doubt? I mean, is that an area where the jury might come back, either a not guilty verdict or a mistrial? It, it very well could be a mistrial, Jesse, because you have two conflicting stories. Of course, Corey Jones is not here to tell his story. We have to go on what Newman Rogers says. People are taught from an early age to trust police, especially when you're a juror. So you have to go on that, but eh, it's 50-50 it's at this point. Yeah, and I mean, again, there's a situation of should he have been there? Or should Raja have been there in the first right. place? How did he approach Jones? What happened during the shooting and what happened after? I mean, he, he even discounted the point that saying that Raja somehow... Uh, you know, planted the gun there. He said there's no evidence to support that theory if the prosecution's suggesting that. That's true. There is no evidence there, but you could at least plant that, that C to say, well, we don't know in those 33 seconds what happened. We don't know in those six seconds what happened before that. So there's a lot that we don't know. So I can understand the prosecution wanting to say that for sure. Yeah, I mean, and they're, they're painting Raja as the victim, that right. he was scared, he thought his life was in danger, and that's a big point. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll be live. Stay tuned. All right, I'm back here with Vincent Hill. Vincent, let's start with what we're seeing right now, this laser sight issue. What do you make of it? Well, to me, Jesse, it doesn't really mean anything. Whether Corey Jones had a laser sight on his weapon, which we know is not true, whether he came out with a, a 380 handgun or an M16, the fact is, did he know that Newman Raja was a police officer or did he think this guy was trying to rob him at three in the morning but again if you're raja and you see this coming out at you you're going to use lethal force you're going to use lethal force but it goes back to did he identify himself as a police officer if he did not do that which 
I don't think he actually did because we've heard audio and nothing to suggest he has. He was in the wrong, Jesse. Well, he said something. We don't know what he said. We don't know what his initial comment was. And I guess the second question would be, did Raja know that Jones didn't know that he was an officer? And that might be an interesting point. Let's take a break. When we come back, we will be live in this courtroom out of Florida. Stay tuned.